Hi, I'm Adam Taylor and I'm going to talk to you today about how we can create image processing platforms for our Xilinx FPGAs and heterogeneous socks such as the Zinc and the Zinc Ultra Scale Plus MP sock. Now what I'm hoping to be able to, to provide you with a skill set is that by the end of this slide deck you'll be able to create a system very similar to one that you see on the left there. This includes the Fleur Lepton 2 thermal imager, uncalled, the Mini Z uh, mini Z board which contains a single uh, a single core zinc and then it's got an output over PMOD to this 10 inch the Avnet 10 inch touch display. Um, why I've created the system such as this is a very simple very basic system interfaces to a camera and to a display uses the zinc both the processor, lo processor logic the, the processor system and the programmable logic uh, to, to create this image, pro image processing system. Now this gives us everything we need from sensor interfacing to output to actually then be able to, to build higher levels on this so we can then use it at we, we could then use it as an SD SOC platform if we wanted to go away and use the revision applications or we could add in additional HLS, uh, HLS functions to do additional image processing but the ability to get the image in and out is what we're, what we're going to look at today. So the reason why actually I chose the, uh, the previous image for the example is that I wanted to remind everybody that the embedded vision spectrum goes not just what we can see in the visible range but also goes from the x-ray to the infrared range and that depends really upon which of the device technologies we choose or the sensor technologies we choose to actually capture the to capture the image with so if we want to work from the x-ray up to the near IR we could we could use a charge coupled device or we could use a CMOS uh, CMOS imaging sensor uh, these will these work really well and very very commonly used in the back of everybody's phones CCDs these days are generally used more for the high-end sort of scientific and astronomy applications now when you're down at the 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 x-ray end it may be that the devices get damaged due to the radiation they have to they wear out and have to be replaced but they will they will function and they will capture allow you to capture images as we move closer and higher up to the to the infrared end actually the wave the wavelength gets the wavelengths get longer and as the wavelength gets longer the electron energy in the incident photon gets smaller now this gives us a problem because we can't <coughs> excuse me this gives us a problem because we can't because that this this incident photon energy isn't sufficient to excite an electron in traditional semiconductors like like silicon therefore when we work with cold infrared devices we need to use more exotic more, more exotic semiconductor materials now when we use into cold infrared they come with a bigger bigger a bigger overhead in terms of uh, st sterling engines to cool room complexity and they also come to sometimes actually with export restrictions and compliance because they can be they have dual use so another another area that is uh, quite common for infrared is to use an uncooled microbolometer type approach in which the in which there is a number of temperature sensitive elements which are used to create an image and that's exactly what was used on the previous slide for uh, for the filler lepton so the filler lepton 2 is an, un is an uncooled I is an uncooled IR one and that tends to operate in a mid the mid uh, the mid IR range so one of the first things we need to do is work out actually what 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 image format that we need that we're getting from and what we're what we will be receiving from our from our sensor so throughout the talk and if you look at the literature about that you'll you'll generally find there's a number of number of image formats uh, available and this will depend upon whether we're interfacing to a camera or a sensor so if we're interfacing to a camera there's a little bit more processing gone off in there it's a little bit more of a refined output that you're getting if you're interfacing to a sensor then you're much likely to be getting a more of a rough and ready initial output that you need to then configure and and, and drive a little bit better and, and clean up so basically you know the world the world works in color we see in color so one of the ways that we we get this is the image format comes out in what's called rgb as general this is called 888 because there are eight bits for each element of the color and we have the which makes a 24-bit pixel uh, this gets a little bit more complicated in how we get to these these elements of the pixels, which we'll talk about later on. But you can get you can get this provided. So this takes an eight bit pixel, it gives you a twenty four bit pixel. The other one we can look at is luminance and chromance elements, which is the standard YUV. Now the standard YUV four 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 actually again very similar to the uh, very similar to RGB actually contains eight bits per pixel for twenty four bit pixel. But what's interesting is the is the Y element contains the luminance. So this is essentially, if you just look at the Y element, you will see a black and white image. <coughs> As you look at the two chrominous elements, you will see the, the blue minus the luminance and the red line minus the luminance. Now what you'll notice actually is that 
in the more pop in one of the more popular scales, 422 of the YUV thing, you actually you each for each pixel you get a new value of luminance, but between two two corresponding pixels, you can share the Y and the U elements. And when you do this, this means that you only need 16 bits per pixel to store. So it gives you a little bit more memory efficient architecture of storing. The final one is the raw is a raw format. The, the final uh, common one is the raw format. So the raw format is just the raw sensor output as it as it comes. Now this will generally be in if you're working in black and white, it will just be a black in grayscale. It will just be a grayscale representation, and that may be eight, ten, or, or twelve bits long. If you're working within a color scheme that your color space that then goes such as RGB or YUV, this will then need to this raw value will represent one of the will represent one channel one wavelength. Of a color element for that pixel, and you will have to do some color filter array interpolation to restore the cut that the actual correct cores of all pixels, pixels around it. So we'll look at that in a little bit more, a little bit more detail. But it's very under, very important to understand the differences between between these three elements as we do it. So we'll look at the image processing chain as I briefly explained on the uh, on the second slide. There is that we we receive an input from our camera. Or, or sensor. Now when we receive an input from our camera or sensor we need to be able to know what the timing on that is. We need to know the number of active pixels, the number of lines, the, the, the refresh rate and such like. So we need to use a time so we need to take the, the take the horizontal and vertical syncs from from that from that uh, cam from that camera or sensor and we need to run it through a timing detection circuit such that we know what how to configure the rest of our downstream downstream array. We may need to do some color space conversion as I mentioned we may need to convert from a raw to an RGB or to a YUV or if we get a, an RGB format we may need to convert to a to a YUV or then to even to a YUV422 format. We then typically will not focus too much on this but we may, may want to do a high level application our algorithms <coughs> our edge enhancements our uh, and noise reduction, uh, you know, object tracking, that sort of thing. So that's where we might want to do that once we've got the once we've got the images in safely into the system in the color space that we want. Then that's when we do our processing algorithms. And typically we do them in two orders. We do the first ones to kind of clean up and restore the image to give it a good as good so we remove as much noise and make it as clear and as sharp as possible. And then we would do our image processing, our higher level image processing algorithm. So that'd be the one that. That we did the edge detection or something like that on it, or or, or 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 some more morphological operations. Once we have that, we want to then really store that in a frame buffer, which is where the video direct memory access comes in. This takes the image stream, writes it into the processor space DDR memory as a frame buffer. To, and then finally, to actually display it, we actually take out the output from the DDR uh, memory. We pull that out, doing a video direct memory access again. And we then output this. Now to do this, we actually need some timing generation because we may want to output this at a different for a different monitor for a different timing resolution than we had before. And the frame buffer serves as a as a delineation between the between the input and the output. So we can use a, a timing generator to actually generate the timing that, that goes out on the back end of it. So it's all very 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 straightforward and very simple actually. So when we look at this in Vivado in our Vivado design this is this is what we would this is what we would see so you'll see a zinc processing system there on the on, on the far right you'll see the AXI interconnect and a, and a reset block now you'll see two AXI interconnects here one connected to a the general purpose master from the processing system this is used for the AXI light configuration uh, of everything and you'll see a AXI smart connect which is connected to the uh, high performance slave on the zinc. So this is the one that we're going to use. This is the interconnect that's used for the VDMA. You'll see within this block, I've created a block called IPC. This is where our image processing chain resides. So in this image processing chain, we have a very, very simple, this is the simplest image processing chain anybody will ever have, ever have seen really. So what we have is we have the video into AXI4 streaming Core. So what this core does is it takes a traditional parallel input which consists of pixel data, uh, vertical and horizontal syncs and uh, pixel act and, and, and video active signals. It takes that and it converts into a AXI4 stream format. The output of the the output of this is then put into a VDMA, uh, the VDMA stream to uh, memory mapped port such that it is written once configured back, once the software configures the VDMA, such as it is written to the processor memory space. 
I don't think it's within the process of memory space. We actually use the same VDMA because it's got both write and read capabilities. So we use the uh, memory map to stream uh, interface to actually go away and uh, output the uh, output the, uh, the the images that pulled down from the pulled down from the frame buffer. Now, as I mentioned, we've got two timing controls in there. The first one is connected to the uh, video in AXI4S and that gives us the timing detection and as again is connected to the uh, AXI, AXI4 light network so that we can see this in real time what the, what the detected mode is and we've actually got a, another video timing control in there that does the timing generation for the output so that generates a H-Syncs, a V-Syncs and what the AXI4 stream video to output does is it takes the AXI4 stream, takes the timing signals and it recreates that into a parallel video output format for us. Now the Eagle Eye does amongst us and those that are really familiar with this will know that we could have used a single video timing controller because we can configure it to for detection and generation and we could pass through the detect what the detected timing is to the to the to the generator within the VTC. However I thought for this example, just as a good example, I would leave the two separate such that we could such that the concept was was demonstrated there. So when it comes to getting started with Avado Design, you've already seen there's a few simple ways we can do it, as I've shown. This is a, a list of some of the IP calls that are in the that are in the Avado IP library. Might look slightly different depending upon what version of Avado you're using, but really the the concept to get across here is there's an awful lot of IP calls that come with this off the box as standard that we should be that we should be using as an as a as an initial part when we want to try and get our image processing chain up and running. Because really what we want to do is focus on our value added activity. So, you know, the customers come to you for a specific reason, for a specific knowledge. It's really not in creating an AXI streaming network or an AXI interconnect or anything like that. It's really about the specific value added knowledge that you add, your algorithms that you're going to create in HLS and then drop into this core to drop into this image processing chain to do the processing pipeline. So what these do here, these IP cores do, is they allow you to get to that point as fast as possible and to prove out that you've got a good image processing chain that you can then drop your drop your core into. So as I mentioned earlier on, one of the first things we've got to do is start at the start at the very beginning. Um, we start at the very beginning with, with interfacing, you know, for whether you're dividing an embedded vision system or any other system, you know, the battle's really won or lost at the interfaces. You know, if, if you're using standard interfaces that everybody else uses and you've minimised your bespoke interfaces, then you are then you're, you stand a good chance of doing it. Now, obviously, one of the beauties of this, actually, is that generally our image processing chain is going to go within the, going to go within the programmable logic of the, of the sync devices. Uh, we're going to use a processor system to configure the image processor chain to adapt to the flows. And yes, we've got the processor, we've got the memory We've got the images sat in processor memory, such that if the processor wanted to, uh, we could we could use that. And particularly with the MPSOC, where we've got the GPU, we could access that and do and do some do some manipulation, some pixel manipulation, or we could read oh, and we and, and use it that way. But actually, generally, you know, all our interfacing from the input to the outputs is going to be done within our program. It will be generally be done within our programmable logic. The beauty of this is that programmable logic, really, with the right file. We can often interface to any standard that we want because we've got the flexibility within the PL to create any custom IP interfaces that we want. So we can make, we can meet not only industry industry standard ones and use IP cores for it, but if necessary, we can interface with bespoke and with legacy as well, which gives us a nice flexibility. So when we talk at, talk about this, you know, with the seven series and up uh, families, we generally get our I/O writing two two varieties: the high range and the high performance. And this allows us to use a lot of a lot of different IOTA standards that we don't that we don't even need a different FI for. Actually, we can just determine these directly on the FPJ pins, which is really good because obviously it reduces the complexity of the board, reduces the complexity of the bomb, reduces the bomb count, etc. So let's take a look, a couple of look at the, the the three most common sort of methodologies of getting signals in and out. So if you're using interfacing to a sensor, such as maybe the uh, Philip the the on semi Python for eighteen hundred you know, a, a high performance, high resolution, high definition sensor, you will get a number of high speed LVDS lines coming out of it. Those high speed LVDS lines will have to be 
decoded and synchronized by yourself within your within your programmable logic but they will come down over a number of high speed LVDS lines. Also, if we were to use a, a camera or a, a camera, then actually maybe we'd get something that uses camera link, which again uses high speed LVDS serialization. So we can use LVDS and we can terminate on our chips. If we're using HDMI for, for an input or an output, then we can use transmission minimized differential signaling on, on a high range of, uh, on a high range buffer, on a high range IO bank. And we can use this to interface with this directly. Now, what's interesting about this is we can take this directly directly into the pins and we can then decode this within the FPGA. And there are several several IP codes that we can use that will allow us to decode that within the within the FPGA themselves. The final one obviously is MIPI, which is very, very, very popular, very, very, a very common standard for both cameras and displays. Now we can use this and interface it if we're using a Zinc or 7 Series FPGA, but we need to pay a little bit of attention to it. And if we're going to do that, then you really need to read Xilinx uh, XAP894. If you're using the Zinc UltraScale Plus, then we have MIPI interface as a standard within there that because that supports the, the, the unique way that MIPI transitions between single-ended and double-ended, or the high-speed and the low-speed interfaces. So, we need to be able to we need to be able to support that, and the old scale MP sort does. So this gives us the ability really with our processing chain to do this. And all we really need to do is is in general is call up the correct the correct I/O interfacing uh, type for our for our FPG. Now here's a simple example of the camera link uh, of how we can of how we can decode camera link. Camera link decodes a number of street sends a number of streams, uh, serialized streams across and the clock across. What we need to do within our device is we need to use the ICERDES, the multi, the, uh, the clock modules, and a, and a simple state machine to actually adjust the adjust the phase of uh, adjust the phase of our of our clock until we till we align until we align with the uh, with the with the expected pattern. So in this case, when you have a lock, <coughs> you you get a pattern on the you get a pattern on the clock. On the clock receiver of one one zero 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 one one, when you see that pattern in your line state machine, you can see that this is this has been this has been correctly received, and is properly done. So I've got a link to where at the back of the slide deck I've got a link to where you can find the code that implements this at the back, no problem. So as I mentioned earlier on, the next stage we've got the we've done the interface and we have the signals coming into our coming into our uh, coming into our zinc. What we really need to do is grab that and start working with it. Now, the best way to grab it and start working with it is actually to use a, is to use the standard interconnect. So, to use the AXI in, AXI interconnect, and because we don't really have any data information, that any address information flowing with this, we can just use the AXI stream. And this is how all these cores generally interface to each other within the uh, within the image processing chain. If you were to go back and look at the IP cores, you'll find that most of them have a AXI stream interface. So what we want to do is we want to get into the AXI stream as fast as possible, convert our input pixels to an AXI stream as fast as possible. So we can do this, obviously some, some cores like the Xilinx MIPI and the HDMI come with AXI stream, come with AXI stream support already. Others, others don't, so as I mentioned, we can use the video into AXI4 stream format. This takes a parallel input, parallel inputs of syncs and, and pick and data and then gives us out the AXI4 stream. What's very interesting to know here is you don't actually have to, and as shown in this diagram at the bottom, you don't actually have to give it the full VGA timing of H-Syncs and V-Syncs where, the, where they're wide for so many lines. And then what, what this is really looking for is really edge pulse signals on the H-Sync and the V-Sync. So if you were to be using it with a camera link uh, system that, come, that gives out a more traditional uh, fray, frame valid, line valid, and pixel data type type structure. Then, then you can still e still quite as easily you use this with a little with a little bit of a uh, little bit of combinatorial logic at the front to just uh, to just set the uh, set the frame active and such like. So, which is actually what this line line down on the bottom is doing. And you can also change it to do more pixels per clock as well if you want. So, AXI stream. I've mentioned it a couple of times now. Give you a little bit more information on it. It is really the way that these cores interconnect. Uh, so I said it, it's a continuous flow of pixels between one IP block and the other, bit, bit, between the upstream IP block and downstream IP block. Uh, now, how we control the flow of these, obviously, is the downstream mm -hmm. peripheral asserts its T ready signal to say that it's ready to receive data, and then the upstream peripheral starts transmitting, saying that it is ready to transmit.
data and it starts transmitting data and it t tells us peripheral downstream that the data is valid because the t-valid flag is asserted now the sort of the smarter uh, 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 smartest of us all will then immediately realize that actually we're just sending this big long stream of pixels down the uh, down the pro down the processing chain down the, down the AX I plus stream, which is which is good because we're moving pixels about from one point to the other at a, at a nice high rate. However, previously before we went into the AX I four stream, we had a understanding of what where the frame started and when a video line started, and we kind of may, you may think we've lost that now, but actually we also use the embedded signals T user. Uh, within the AXI frame, which you can see down the bottom, which indicates the start of a frame, and then T last is asserted at the end of at the end of every line. This ability knows where this ability then gives us the ability to recreate the frames as necessary in terms of lines, lines and frame sizes. So as we've as we've got the input, as we've got the image coming in, and it's an input, so it's generally going to come in with its own pixel clock domain. And that's what we're going to use in this in this first instance. There'll be a pixel clock. It will go into the AXI4 stream. But actually, the AXI4 stream we're going to have generally running at a higher frequency than the pixel clock. So we'll have an we'll have an AXI4 stream clock, an image processing clock domain, and then we'll have an out we will have an output. So in the very simplest, the clock domains we'll end up with two clock domains: the pixel clocks, the pixel clock, and the image processing chain. The pixel clocks. In the simplest one, will be the same, so they'd be the same pixel clock. They don't have to be if we were doing different inputs and different out, different input format or different output formats. The pixel clocks could be different. Well, the image processing chain, we need to make sure that the that the clock rate is suitable, such that we don't store the code and we can meet the we can meet the required frame rate. So it's good practice to ensure the to minimise buffering in the in this uh, image processing chain. It's good practice to ensure that we always have the stream clock is greater than the pixel clock. Now, what we can do is we can use the flexibility of reconfigurable clocking to actually be able to change the pixel clocks and the image processing chain clock on on the fly. Now, that's very that is very important. So, how we do this is we can use obviously we can use the clocking wizard. On the clocking wizard, we can enable an AXI light port, such that we can then use the video timing controller which detects the video timing mode once we detect the video timing mode we can then configure the, pro, the configure any pixel clocks that are needed for that correct timing mode and we can also configure the AXI stream clock the, the image processing clock if necessary and you know sim simple things you know in terms of the uh, the pixel clocks you know ranges of 20 meg to 108 meg are commonly required even even faster for some, for some of the ultra high definition definition uh, definition displays. So we can we can use this to create a flexible clocking architecture, and obviously we can we can then use software to change it on the fly. Now one thing you might see throughout a number of the IP codes if you're looking at them is you'll see the number of pixels per clock, and this is number of pixels that are transmitted per clock. So if you need to transmit, you can transmit traditionally you would transmit one pixel per clock. Or maybe you to do, if you wanted to double the throughput, <coughs> you could transmit two or four or eight pixels per clock. However, we need to be a little careful when we do this because not all of the IP codes can support multiple pixels per clock. So if we're going to do this, because we have to do this throughout the entire more or less the entire image processing chain, we have to make sure or, or create a conversion block. We have to make sure that we have cores that can support this and as we do this obviously the, the more pixels we process in parallel the, the the more we decrease the latency of the image from the from from the input to the output but by doing that we increase this at the at the expense of the resources required in the FPGA to implement it so as always as an engineer our job is to carefully monitor that trade-off and ensure that we're not under constraining ourselves and that we're not going to then be able to meet our latency requirements <coughs> although we're over constraining ourselves and that we are that we are using constraint we are using logic resources that we don't need to because that would detract from our ability to then use high level synthesis like revision and and such like and it may even drive us to use it to select a more a larger part than we would that we would necessarily need for that application so as I said, we can we can change all the clocking depending upon detecting of the detecting the pixel mode. So what the video mode? So what we can, what we see here down in the bottom right is an example of this. 
where you have a video input and the video timing controller just configured to act as a detector. Now when it's connected, connected to act as a detector, we don't need to give it the pixel, we don't need to give it pixels, it's just getting the H-Sync, V-Sync and active videos, uh, active video signals from the incoming parallel data stream. And what this does is it looks at the timing and the relationship between these two to actually determine the video mode. And then in, then in the software API that comes with this, there's a nice little header file that then lists a nice list of number of modes. And what you get when you run this through is you get a mode returned as to which as to which mode's currently being detected on your video input. Once you know this mode, then you can go away and start configuring your pixel clocks and your image processing chains for the correct mode. So for a little example, a few weeks ago, I did some blogs around this, so I thought I'd, I thought I'd give an example here. And what you can see here is the Z board with the FMC HDMI board on it, and the pink acting as a video generator, so the pink's generating video in different formats and sending it across. <coughs> the zinc has the design that I was showed previous on the previous page, and it's just picking up the picking up and detecting the modes. So you can see here for the SXGA mode at 1280 pixels and 1024 lines, it's detecting it correctly, and at 720p, it's also detecting it detecting it correctly. I do realise that I need to dust my desk. I will get round to it. Now, one of the things we've talked about, we've got the so where are we now? We've got the we've got the image into the system. We've got it into the we've we have got it into an AXI4 streaming format. We've detected any uh, video type. We've detected the video timing modes of it. We've configured any clocks that we want to be able to do if if need to be able to do. Now, if we're working, as I mentioned earlier on, if we're working with a sensor, then we will need to be a color sensor. Then we will need to be able to convert the color because. The color will come down. Will be the pixel data to us will be provided as a raw pixel format. What that pixel, that what raw pixel will contain, is just a standard, a standard uh, color, one for one color, one wavelength, and that will be either red, green, or red, green, or blue. And how we do this is that the four pixels as a quad will contain will will contain will have filters over the pixels such that they only allow through red blue or green light in that in the into each of the pixels within that within that quad we can then use that quad and we can do some color filter array interpolation to actually then recreate the color across the entire across the entire range this pattern is called a bayer pattern and you may think that it reduces significantly the image resolution because we essentially were only gathering light for one for one wavelength in one pixel, but it doesn't reduce it quite as much as you think. It reduces it by about uh, by about twenty percent. The reason why there are two green as opposed to uh, and only one red and one blue is that actually, if you think about it, the red and the blue are the extreme ends of the of the of the visible spectrum that we see. The green is much more in the centre of the two, and as such, we're more sensitive to that. That's why there are more. That's why there are two green pixels two green ones within the within the quad so when it comes to color space so there we've done the we've taken the raw we took we can take a raw image and we can convert it to a to an rgb output so now we've taken the raw pixels and we've now got a we've now got a color pixel for each pic a, a color color pixel for each pixel in the image coming through in our image processing chain but we might not have it in the correct color space that we want we may want to convert that rgb across to yuv and then we may want to subscale that down to yuv422 such that we can use the 16 bits per pixel because that's easier to store in memory and uses a third less memory than using the uh, the using 444 so if we're going to do this we can use there's a, a core that's really helpfully provided called the video processing subsystem core that we can insert and this this core is actually very useful it does more than just color space conversion so it allows us to do it allows us to do de scaling of images frame rate conversion up and down it's a very useful core that we that we that we should that should be worth your looking at worth a little, little bit of time considering if you're going to be developing image processing systems so we've now got the image now got it in, we've got the timing, we've configured it correctly, we've done any colour filter array interpolation we need, we've done any colour space conversion we need from one colour domain to the next. The next thing we really need to do to just prove the image processing pipeline before we do our image processing algorithm is VDMA. Now VDMA takes the output, the image stream, and stores it as a frame buffer within the processor DDR. As you can see this block down the bottom which is which is set up around there, it uses the pro the processor obviously configures the the VDMA, the processor also got access to the D to, to the DDR. 
and we can and this is how this is how we do it we can we can sync the vdma if if we nece if necessarily we, we want and all all of it the frame buffer size the frame buffer location everything related to it is all done under control of the supervising processor in our case the zinc it's all done it's all done by all done by the zinc uh so it sets up the frame buffers and then and then starts it running <coughs> well, let's take a little bit more of a look at that so what we do what we see there's if you start this running you'll see that it actually gets put into the process of memory so what you, what you can see here on the two examples actually is the is the pixel data present being written to the memory location now as you remember back so this is a 24-bit pixel as you remember back this is showing that it has 24 bits per pixel uh, but actually the word each memory words 32 bits in, in, in sync as you can as you can see here so actually what we have is a slight problem because we have to pack it efficiently VDMA packs one pixel in the next pixel. So it share, if there's spare bytes in the pixel in the pixel in the memory space, it shares them. So what you can see here is it makes it a little bit a little difficult to actually understand on the left, it makes it a little bit more difficult to understand what's going off. If you actually format the memory monitor to uh, just display a single byte, then you can see quite easily the very simple pattern that the pixels the pixels are the pixels are dis are displaying. <coughs> now once we have this video in memory this image in memory now is a good point actually that we might want to consider if we want to verify this data from verify this data in the memory and this just allows us to prove that we can grab the data we can read it we can write it now if we're creating an image processing system and we just want to go from an input to a display that that's that's great and we can see it going through but actually sometimes you know we're creating uh, systems which are very critical on performance, particularly noise and couple and noise being coupled into the image in scientific and industrial applications. Uh, so we want to be very make very careful uh, to do this. And you can't really analyze the effects of the image just by looking at it on a screen. So you need to be able to grab the grab the data out. So there's a couple of ways, a couple of different ways we can do this. Obviously, the most the most simple ways we can grab the data that's in the mem that's that's in memory, and we get that because it's in the PSDDR memory. And we can send it out over RS232, which would take a little bit of time, gig Ethernet USB or something. And what we really want to do is be able to actually see, is to actually recreate the patch to draw the image essentially, and to view the image in a in a in a viewer like paint or something. So because if we don't got that, then we can put it put it in, and we can look at the image histogram. We can work out if we need to do. Histogram equalization. We can look at the noise and see whether we need to we need to do anything related to noise or not. And we can also look at how number how many defective pixels we've got within the area and which ones are which ones are stuck out or not. So we can write a simple software function. Look at the next slide. Simple software function that I wrote that actually takes the output. You put a simple header file. You you write, you write a simple header file. Simple simple bit of a loop. And all this does is it writes out over the uh, writes out over your selected uh, output into a uh, into hex values that represent a BMP file. Uh, and then you can use this little tickle script that I've got on the left that will convert that from being the ASCII values into being a being a raw 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 a raw file of the same value such that you can open that that in there. The links to all this to how this all works are at the are at the back of the presentation. Now as we come through We've done our we've done our inputs, we've done our out we've done our inputs, we've done our timing detection, we've done our we've done our colour filter away, we've done our correction, we've done the VDMA, we've got the VDMA in memory. And what we really want to do sometimes is we want to perhaps merge multiple displays into one and and then do an output. Now normally we may we may do this before or we may do this after our uh, our VDMA in this in this case actually this example I've done it after the VDMA on the downstream side of it but we, we've done some video mixing so maybe we have a couple of video VDMA channels and we have one output and we want to merge those two together and do a picture in picture or something or maybe we want to overlay them as layers in there so we can use the we can use the video mixer that comes with the IP course to do this this gives us the ability to have up to seven sources so we can have seven layers stacked upon each other and we can then use alpha, use the define the control the alpha for each one of these layers, such that we can mix them all together. What does this look like? On the next slide, you can see the 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 um, the seven layer the the layers of alpha, the height that we have, the height and the width. So we could create a height, we could create 
we could create a wider and higher picture than we have and stitch a number of pictures together in them as you can see in the example on the top where it's kind of putting a start a smaller pixel a smaller image uh, in more towards the center center of the image and then do the blending such that we can define the transparency what this looks like when we put it together actually as you can see here looking at the avnet uh, 8 inch touch displays you can see the you can see a fleur lepton in the top left hand corner in the image on the left bad example of my elbow and a few cables you can then see three test pattern generators that have been all all added together so you can so you can see the tartan color bars and a, and a couple of other ones you can see them all stitched together to form to form one one image there which is an example use of how we could use the video mixer on the right hand side you can see another example of the fleur lepton but this time the fleur lepton has been is taking the full of taking the full amount of the screen again but what we've done is the video test pattern generator is we positioned it smaller in the center of the in the center of the image and in the first in the top top image you can see there that it's actually that it's actually turned the alpha's turned on such that it sits on top of the top of the um, uh, flow lepton image and you can and you can see that if you look on the one below that <coughs> you can see that ve it's very the alpha's been turned way back it's still present but it, it's kind of difficult to see so it gives us the ability to fade things in and out and and do the do the filtering so this is actually a very useful very useful mixing uh, very useful ip core i found when, when i've been doing a few applications so we've got this we've got it all the way through we've got we've done any mixing that we want we've got our vdma coming out now what we want to do is set up our output timing so we can use a video timing controller block again to actually uh, to as opposed to this time detecting the wave detecting the timing settings to generate in the timing settings and we use this block in conjunction with the axi4 stream to output video block and this is a block that provides the timing information for that so it's possible we can, obviously we can configure this over axi light again using the processor it's possible to use one video timing controller and pass the timing control the detector parameters to the to the generator as well if you want such that the input video has the same format as the output as the output video now sometimes we may want to synchronize the output video and the output video timing controller to an out to an external source maybe this is because it's an in, it's an industrial or scientific application and we want to synchronize to, to minimize noise now the synchronization is quite easily we can use an external frame sync pulse on the timing controller however one one thing i've found over the years of doing this actually is that we do also need to control the gen clock enable pin because if we don't control the gen clock enable pin at the, at the end of each at the end of each uh, timing timing waveform the video timing controller will begin to free run it won't wait for the next it won't wait for the it won't stop and wait for the next uh F external f sync pulse coming in so what we need to do is to do to, to get that to work properly is we need to configure the video timing controller for the very last thing it does is to output an output frame sync pulse at the end at the very end of its uh, very end of its output timing such that we can disable the gen clock enable pin such that it doesn't start running again until we receive the next frame sync pulse externally at which point we can start off the process again just for those that are curious about it, I have uh, some links at the back and some slides at the back showing how you can do this in a little bit more detail. The final block, of course, is the AXI stream to output. This synchronizes the timing generation, so it's come from the video timing controller with the incoming AXI4 stream. So remember, the AXI4 stream has uh, timing and location information in it in terms of it knows when the frame starts, it knows when the end of each line ends. It then receives from the video timing controller, acting as a generator, it then receives a vertical sync, a horizontal mm -hmm. sync, blanking information, and it will receive the active pixel information as well. So that this, this core then goes through a synchronization phase and synchronizes all the way through and then generates its own output parallel video and syncs that we can use if we're using a VGA we can put those directly in or if we're using an external codec we can we can copy those externally in there okay so we've gone all the way through here we've gone from the beginning to the end and we've and hopefully you kind of understand a little bit more about what's going off in this processing chain but like everything you get to the end and sometimes it just 
doesn't quite work the way you thought it was going to do. And that's the beauty of engineering, because you just keep knocking the problems down until one day it magically, until one day it works, and then you forget all the pain that you've been through, and you go, well, hey, what project comes next? So there's a few things to check out if it's not working. Uh, the first thing to check out are clocks and resets. There's a lot of clocks and resets, a lot of, clock it, a lot of clocks and resets in this. Make sure that you've got the correct clock and the correct reset associated with the, with the correct block, that you've not accidentally put the pixel clock in somewhere where you thought you'd put in a high-speed image processing clock chain. Check the enables. Again, a lot of the blocks have enable pins, so make sure that they're tied off to the correct state. Check the video timing controller. If you've got a video timing controller, it's possible that the source registers, which define the output timing, the output timing generation, the, 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 regi the output, the information for that can come from two sources. It can come from the detector or it can come from the registers from the AXI light. You have to configure using AXI light which one of the, which one of the sources the timing generator comes from. If you fail you to do that, it means that it will use the detector by default and that might result in you not getting your timing correctly, particularly if you don't have a detector and you're just trying to output that standard, standard frame. Check the AXI video AXI to video out. It's configured for master mode if you're using v, VDMA. It should be in the master mode and not in the slave mode in that case. And if you're doing that, then make sure that the video timing controller clock enable signal is not connected to the VTC clock gen enable signal. Otherwise, that's going to cause quite a little bit of confusion and prevent you from syncing up. Now, when we do VDMA, there's a thing called horizontal size and vertical size. The vertical size is the number of lines, quite simple. The horizontal size is the number of, you might think, is the number of pixels on a line. It is, but it's all, but but you to store the to store a pixel to store the pixel line in memory accurately, you need to know how many bytes make up make up each pixel. So the horizontal size is defined in bytes, and is basically the pixels, the, the, the number of pixels multiplied by the number of bytes per pixel, and this goes for the stride as well. So the stride is what tells the VDMA. The, the 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 distance between a line between a, a video image line in the processor memory so without that stride it can't if the stride's not set correctly you can't work out it can't work out where the, the next lines start and end obviously if the stride's different to the actual line length if you def decline it wrong then you will get some very weird interconnect inter issues and, and demonstrations obviously the final one is you know insert some ILAs in there and and, and look at what's going off my favourite places to put them are on the back end of the AXI video to out and its status outputs. And obviously, if, if necessary, you can use a, a JTAG to AXI bridge to try and configure uh, JTAG elements with, to try and configure elements within there and, and try what if scenarios. And my final point really is check the connections as well. Make sure that there are any horizontal blanks, vertical blanks, active videos are all connected if used and they're connected correctly because it's quite easy to connect a H-sync to a V-sync or a V-blank to a H-sync. Just, just take a little bit of time and make sure that they are all, they are all connected properly. So that's it really. This has uh, been a quick sort of video showing you how to go from the input to the output of an, to the image. What this gives you is the basic ability to then go away and start doing high level interesting image processing and you can to do that you can use HLS or you could migrate into SD so I can use the XF the XF OpenCV libraries. Actually you can use the XF OpenCV libraries in HLS as well. And you can you can really get a lot of a lot of benefit out of out of using those libraries and a lot and save yourselves a lot of time. So as I mentioned a few times throughout this design, uh, some of you may know or not, I've been writing a blog for the last few years on the MicroZ uh, hosted by Xilinx. You can find a number here uh, of the examples on my GitHub, number of examples of how to go away and do it, and then some links to some of the blogs there that that, that explain it, and hopefully that provides Sorry, all the information you wrong. need to know. Uh, and the final one there is the uh, if you have any issues, you can uh, you can find my you can find my website there, and you can you can drop me an email. But apart from that, thank you very much for for listening, and I will uh, yeah look forward to hearing from you. Bye bye.